Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thanks for coming, especially the in-person audience and also for everybody that's watching on Zoom. Today's presenter is Manish Devana. Uh, this is a little bit of background on him. Uh, he got his Bachelor of Science and his Master's in Physical Oceanography, both at the University of Southampton. Uh, Manish is currently, currently a 50 year PhD candidate from the MPO department here at UM and Dr. Jones is his advisor. Uh, Manish's main research interests at UM have been understanding the physical mechanisms uh, that, divide, that, that drives the deep North Atlantic circulation and his next endeavor will be a postdoc position at Woodhull Oceanography Institute Institution, where he will transition to developing and applying methods for monitoring uh, biochemical cycles, biogeochemical cycles. Sorry. So, the floor is your explanation. Thanks, Ivanis. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, yeah, so this is sort of everything I've been up to for the last five years of uh, my thesis. Uh, so, it's called, the title is a multi scale investigation of the Iceland Scotland overflow. Um, and my advisor is Dr. Bill Johns, and those are my committee members. So when I thank them, they've all been super helpful in figuring out some of the tougher problems that I've had. Okay, so a little overview of what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, I'll give a little background on what the Iceland Scotland overflow is, and then it just sort of breaks down into my three chapters. Uh, the first chapter is a fresh start, has to look into sort of what drove a freshening event in the Iceland Scotland overflow. The second chapter it is stuck in a rut uh, because I was stuck for quite a while and there was a literal rut We'll, we'll come to that. Uh, and then the last chapter is called Bumpy Roads. So looking at bottom enhanced mixing over really rough topography and what are the impacts from that mixing. Okay. So a little background on what Iceland Scotland overflow is. So Ice, Iceland Scotland overflow or ISO as I'll call it for the rest of the talk is this combination of deep cold dense waters that form in the Nordic seas. So to the north in this diagram and they spill through uh, mainly the Fairbank Channel, so that little curvy arrow in the top right of the plot. And as they spill through, they come in contact with warm upper ocean North Atlantic water, warm and salty, and so they, they mix together through this process called entrainment. And then they sink and form this current that follows the boundary of the Iceland Basin. And from there, they go on to be exported to the rest of the uh, Lower, lower North Atlantic system, and it's a really important water mass because it ends up forming about a quarter of the lower limb of the AMOC, so of all the deep circulation in the North Atlantic, it's about a quarter of it. And so we observe the ISO at the, the line, the mooring line indicated on the diagram. So we, we observe it before it's had a chance to be exported out and sort of into the larger system. So to give you an idea of what sort of the mooring sees, these are mean snapshots of the, the mooring section. So you can see where the moorings are. The top panel is potential temperature and the bottom panel is salinity. So uh, the actual ISO layer is uh, the 27.8 isopycnal, so that contour that has the label. Everything below that is the overflow layer. And the stratification is largely set by the temperature in this layer. And then we have this really clear bottom enhanced salinity signal which is a feature of the fact that ISO entrains upper ocean water when it forms. And that'll be kind of important in a later part of this talk. And so the other thing we measure is velocity. So to orient you, orient you a little bit, this is the positive values, the red values are positive southward, so out of the page when you're looking at it. Um, and the flow is sort of typically split up into these three cores. So you have one at the top of the ridge, you have one in this big rift valley where the D2 mooring is, and then you have an offshore or off ridge, sort of right at the base of the ridge core, and then sort of northward flow, which is that little blue sliver towards the right of the plot. So that's sort of the mean picture of what we see in ISO. And the research that I focus on sort of ended up splitting across like three separate uh, spatial and temporal scales. So the first chapter looked at sort of layer-wide hydrographic changes and what causes that. And you sort of have to encompass a pretty large part of the North Atlantic or Iceland Basin circulation to really understand what's going on. Uh, and then we zoom in to sort of what's the mesoscale, so under 100 kilometers, sort of sub-seasonal variability in the transport that we measure. 
and we look at sort of what controls this transport variability of the ISO that ends up being exported into the Atlantic. Uh, and then for the last chapter, we zoomed in even more to sort of like the turbulence scale. So you're talking like less than a meter kind of scales. And I looked at sort of what are those processes and how that impacts sort of the larger ISO system. So I'm gonna start with the first chapter looking at sort of the large scale hydrographic processes. And this uh, whole chapter was motivated by the fact that the OSNAP observations showed this really dramatic change in salinity. So what you're looking at here is the salinity change between the, the last year at the time of the time the study was done, so 2017 to 2018, and the first year. And you get these sort of maximum changes around 0.01 PSU of decline. And so this, sim this sort of magnitude change, the last time it was documented in the overflow layer, took place over sort of a multi-decadal event, but we see it happen over like two years. So we wanna know what's causing that. Uh, so to sort of dive into it, uh, this plot takes a little bit of orienting. So the left panel is the upper ocean salinity anomalies from the mooring, so that rectangular box at the top, it's averaged through depth, and so you get a time series of the salinity anomaly. And then similar plot for the deep instruments, so indicated on the bottom part of the plot on the right. And so what this shows us is sort of mid 2015, so starting on the left panel, you see this arrival of this big sort of negative salinity anomaly, a freshening anomaly that arrives on the western side of the basin, or sorry, eastern side of the basin. And about a year and a half to two years later, we see it arrive in the deep ocean, except it starts on the eastern side, and we'll, we'll see why that starts sort of on the opposite side in a few moments. Uh, so this upper ocean salinity anomaly was sort of investigated pretty thoroughly by Holiday et al. And I was really interested in, is it the same anomaly that's driving the deep freshening? And if so, how? And can we prove how that's happening? So what I did was I looked at sort of how ISO is formed. So you have this sort of warm water coming in, that's this red arrow, and the cold, dense water overflowing. And so my hypothesis essentially is that entrainment of that upper ocean anomaly is what drove the freshening. So to, to prove that hypothesis, I wanted to see if I could look at the advective time scale. So how long does it take that signal to propagate on that upper ocean part of the pathway and the deep ocean pathway, and can that sort of fit with the lag we see between the upper and deep ocean? So starting with the upper ocean, I tried to establish what was that advective time scale. Uh, I'm not gonna go a ton into the detail, but this essentially I used the global surface drifter data set and built sort of a statistical representation of velocities in the North Atlantic and released sort of virtual particles to see what paths they took to get to where entrainment happens in that little purple box in the top right of the map and how long it took to get there. So this bottom left plot, the big one, on the top you see the histogram that shows where on like what longitude did the particles cross the OSNAP line. This was important because we wanted to know, are we actually measuring the signal coming through this North Atlantic current that crosses here? And sure enough, it sort of towards the eastern side between our mooring array, which is exactly what we saw in the salinity anomalies. And then the histogram on the right side shows the time. So on average, it took about four to six months to go from the OSNAP line. So these times are from that mooring line to that purple box. So we have this sort of four to six month average advective time scale in the upper ocean. Now, the next thing I did was I took Argo data from inside where that purple box is to see if we could actually observe the salinity signal. So that's what we see here. Um, you can see really clearly sort of late 2015, we get this onset of fresh waters. That's the blue coloring. But the entrainment is really happening at sort of 600, 700 meters depth. Those are the depths that the overflow is actually spilling into the Iceland basin. So we are not just interested in when it arrived in the upper ocean, we're interested in how long that salinity signal, if it did at all, propagate downwards. And it very clearly propagated downwards, uh, takes another about six months. And this downward propagation is part of this regular seasonal subpolar mode water formation. You get a bunch of heat loss and the water sort of deepens the mix layer and you get this signal propagating downwards. So now we have a time scale for how long the upper ocean waters take to get to Faribank Channel and how long they take to mix down. So now I could sort of directly take the salinity record from the Argo data, so right at the bottom level at 600 meters, 
and I did some lagged cross correlations to see if anything lined up really well. And the M1 moorings are the furthest to the east or to the west where we saw that salinity signal arrive in ISO first, had a significant correlation and it was little, about a seven to eight month lag, which fits really well with what we're seeing. Uh, so we have the upper ocean part seems to line up really well. The next and final part was, can we look at the deep advective time scale? And here, we don't really have observations that can let us do this. Observing the deep currents like that is pretty tricky. So we turned to the flame ocean model, and which has 3D ocean velocities. And I did some experiments where I released drifters at sort of where the two cores of flow that are resolved in the model are. So the red one is the core of flow that is near the top of the ridge, and the green trajectories are the ones that are at the base of the ridge. And you see the, that red, those red trajectories have this sort of fast pathway and it takes about seven to eight months. And then on the basin interior where the pathways are sort of more circuitous, you get this longer delay, delayed arrival of a signal. And that's exactly what we see uh, in the overflow layer. So it worked out really nicely. It shows up first on the east, on the western side. And then as time progresses, you get the whole layer becoming really, really fresh. So you can add up all these time scales put together an entire story and you get this total advective time scale of about a year and a half to two years, depending on where in the ISO plume you look at. And so this is a really nice way of showing that, okay, this salinity signal was driven by entrainment. Uh, yeah, so that's a little summary. And then I'm gonna just say a few points about why that is important beyond just, okay, we showed why it got fresh. Um, so yeah, we broke down the components and showed why it got fresh. But the important of this importance of this is really that these big, fast anomalies can hit the deep ocean really quickly. We tend to think of sort of deep water formation as this slower, longer time scale process, but you created essentially a decadal scale change in salinity in less than, in about two years. So this is sort of a really important piece of understanding how anomalies go through the AMOC system. Okay, so that was chapter one. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. And now we're gonna zoom in to the mesoscale to transport variability of the plume. So it's a little motivation. This very wiggly plot is the transport uh, time series from the overflow, from the OSNAP array. Uh, so positive is southward, so the amount to the exported out of the basin. And it's pretty clear, there's a ton of variability sort of around a mean of about five and a half sphere drips. You can get periods of up to 15 on the tripling. You also can get sort of net reversals. And this is sort of especially surprising because the actual overflow at Fairbank Channel is far more steady. So you wouldn't expect that sort of variability coming out of the overflow. So we want to understand what's going on. Okay. So the, the first thing I did was knowing that their flow was sort of split up into this on ridge flow and off ridge flow, I broke up the transport. I basically split it. Uh, east and west of that red line that's on the, the figure on the top. So everything to the left or to the west of that red line is the red time series in the plot below. And everything to the eastern side or the left right side of that plot is the blue. And then the black is the total transport. Uh, for just anyone who might be wondering, when I say transport, I mean basically the amount underneath the 27.8 isopignal, so that bold contour on that top plot. And so some things immediately stood out. The variability on the eastern side, so that blue curve, really seems to dominate the sort of net transport variability. Even though the mean transport is really contained on the ridge, is the variability is contained in the flow off the ridge. Uh, and then we got this sort of opposing trends in the on and offshore region. And we think that's probably due, we see sort of an increase in the offshore or off ridge flow by D4 in the last couple of years of the mooring array, but I don't really have a good indication of what might be causing that. And then the next thing I did, I looked at sort of the transport, but broken up into density space. So these, the plot on the, the right indicates transport in 0.02 potential density bins. And you get this sort of consistent pattern across, and each line is one year average. So you get this consistent pattern where you get a lighter core and then sort of weaker transport in the intermediate densities and then a, a more dense core. So that sort of makes sense when you think about there's a light, a plume further up the ridge, 
and then a plume further down the ridge. I think one thing that was sort of really stood out and is important from this, that dashed line on the right-hand plot is the 27.8 isopycnal. And if you look at the velocity contours on the top and the transport, that transport that is just above, so just lighter than 27.8, seems pretty linked to the stuff that's just below 27.0. 27.8 up at the D1 more. So it kind of raises the question, is 27.8 the best indic like the best like cutoff for how we calculate this transport? Okay. So that didn't show as well as I'd hoped, but there, so the next thing I try to really understand the characteristics of the flow at the mooring array. So these are variance ellipses from the bottom three current meters at the array. So black is the deepest, Red is the second deepest, and orange is the third deepest at each uh, instrument. Uh, so some, some key things stand out immediately. Up at the top of the ridge, so M1 and D1, you get this sort of consistent downslope rotation. And this ends up being a quite interesting feature that I'll come, at, come to in the third part of this talk. Um, and then where D2 is, it sits in this sort of deep valley, and you can see at depth that black arrow it's really oriented along the valley, so it seems like the valley is really funneling the flow. And when you move further to the east, the flow, so the vari variance ellipses get more circular and less elliptical. It indicates that the flow is sort of more isotropic and less sort of directed in one direction. And that's what we see, especially out at D4 and D5, sort of more isotropic flow instead of like directed plume flow that's mostly oriented southward. And I don't go into it much here, but the variability at D4 and D5 is really largely driven by the barotropic variability from the North Atlantic Current and the eddies in the Iceland Basin. Uh, so I was more interested in what's happening really on the ridge, because that's where the bulk of the transport is happening. So try to understand this flow a little bit more. So these are spectra of, the, of four of the moorings that sort of sit right in the cores of flow. So D1 up at the top of the ridge, D2 in the valley, and then D4 and D5 are the off-ridge ones. So there's a lot of interesting features that kind of stand out, but the key ones that I really want to be take-home points are at D1, you get sort of this variability that is strongest, higher in the water column, so around 1,200 meters, and it's pretty uniform with depth. It just gets weaker. But when you move over to D2, that variability, so those, those red and yellow curves, which are the deeper current meter spectra, are much stronger. So that variability is sort of bottom enhanced within the valley. And all of this variability is sort of higher frequency, so shorter period than 30 day, compared to D4 and D5, which are dominated more by sort of longer time scale variability. And that has to do with the fact that they're more linked to sort of the barotropic variability of the eddies in the in the Iceland Basin. So now to dive even further, I took the current meters and I use that along slope component so the, that component of flow I showed in those velocity contours and I did an EOF decomposition. So these are the first two modes. The first one is on the top, the bottom one, the second one is on the bottom. And they both have a similar amount of explained variance. So the first one is about 20% and the second mode is 17%. They show, so we'll go mode by mode. That first mode has this really intense amplitude in the valley. And then that second mode sort of has uh, strong amplitudes by D1, where we also see a, a core of flow. And then it's got these sort of alternating positive and negative bands as you move across the ridge. And now we can look at the, the temp, like the time spectra. So these are variance per serving spectra of the principal components for each of those modes. And we can see that that first principal component seems to really line up with what's happening at D2, which makes sense because there's a strong core of flow and that's where the mode amplitude is strongest for that mode. So this first mode seems to be pretty strongly linked to whatever's happening in the Rift Valley where we have that D2 mooring. Um, okay. So the velocity variance is interesting, but what we really are interested in is how's the transport variability being affected. So you can take those mode amplitudes and multiplying by the principal component, you get essentially a velocity anomaly, and you can calculate the transport anomaly associated with each mode. So that's what this plot shows. The black line is the total transport between M1 and M2, and then the red are mode one and mode two, respectively. 
And so even though they explain a similar amount of velocity variance, mode one dominates nearly all of the transport variability. So about 75% of the transport variability is all linked to mode one. So clearly whatever is happening in this Rift Valley is playing a really significant control on the transport variability across the whole post-synapse section. So really spent some time trying to figure out what is going on here. And that's why this chapter is called Stuck in a Rut because tried a lot of things. Uh, nothing really stood out. So these are correlations of densi potential density and velocity at the bottom four levels at D2. So those four deepest diamonds indicated on this plot. And as you can see that there's not really any clear relationship at all. If you look in time space, so these are spectra of the velocity and temperature at the D2 mooring. And the variability in velocity is pretty distinct from the variability in temperature. So there's not really a clear understanding coming out of this of what's going on. But one thing that is immediately sort of jumped to mind is, okay, there's this flow in this valley and the valley is sort of on the order of the Rossby scale. So does geosophy really work? Because a lot of the ISO estimates of transport from CTD sections historically have used geosophy. So I used the temperature temperature and salinity fields from the mooring array and so calculated geostrophic shear, reference it to the 1200 meter observed velocities, and you get this top left panel, which are the mean geostrophic velocities. And in case you don't remember what the full, ge full velocity field looks like, I took the difference between the geostrophic and the observed velocity, and that's the right hand side. And geostrophy doesn't really recover any of the flow within the valley. And so we, we did some experiments trying to see if this was a gridding issue. And we can basically realize that of the density shear that we do resolve, you can't really grid it in any realistic way to recover that shear that's in the valley. So this is not really a gridding problem. It really is like not geostrophic shear in that valley. Uh, so if you do the transport calculation using those geostrophic velocities, you get the blue time series, or the red time series, sorry, in the plot on the bottom. and it's about two thirds of the observed transport. So you're missing about a third of the transport that's happening on the ridge if you use geostrophy, which is pretty significant result. Um, so when it turned out to be a geostrophy, we really wanted to see if there was some explanation. So I obviously that principal component, first uh, principal component in EOF mode showed a lot of variability in that valley. So I tried to basically correlate the principal component time series with the geostrophic transport across the whole ridge, the top left scatter plot. And then I tried to correlate it with the geostrophic transport and there's very little correlation. There's also very little correlation with the ageostrophic transport, so the bottom left. But if you zoom in to just around the valley, like through the whole water column, then the transport in the valley, the ageostrophic transport is really strongly correlated with that principal component. So that, that EOF mode is really describing some sort of ageostrophic mode. Uh, yeah. So one of the last things I tried that still didn't really show us much, I basically took all of the high ageostrophic and low ageostrophic transport events and averaged them together to get composite profiles of velocity, density, salinity, and temperature. So you can compare the high ageostrophic transport velocity in the top right, top left panel. And you see that clear bottom enhanced velocity signal like we saw in the mode. But the hydrographic structure doesn't really change at all between the high and low ageostrophic transport. And this is sort of where we hit a limit on what we could do with the observations we had and the models that we looked at don't resolve the flow in the valley in the first place. So it's hard to, to use them to assess what's going on. So that sort of the stuck in the ruck part of this. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what's going on there and came up with basically nada. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's how science works. Uh, but so we took this result and then I wanted to think about, okay, we have this variability. How does it impact the larger AMOC system? So this OSNAP array that we work with is part of a larger sort of cross Atlantic array and we calculate the overturning circulation across the eastern side, which is shown on the, the green ellipse at the bottom. And so I basically correlated the 
part of the overturning streams function where the density matched the ISO density space. And so that plot on the right, the black line is showing that sort of total correlation between the total transport of ISO and the total stream function in that density range. And if you do that split again that I did in the first part of this section, basically all of that relationship between the MOC strength and the ISO transport variability is contained in this on ridge part of the flow. So that angiostrophic transport that is driving a lot of the variability ends up leaving a really sort of significant mark on the MOC across here, which is important because a lot of MOC calculations assume geostrophy. Uh, so a little bit of a summary. Uh, so we looked at the modes of what this sort of intrinsic variability, I called it intrinsic because I couldn't explain it. <laughs> um, and then if you try to use geostrophy, you only get about two thirds of the total ISO transport that you get if you calculate it directly using current meters. And so a key takeaway from this is when you're doing these transport estimates across regions of really rough topography with large features like a rift valley, where you sample is probably a big sensitivity issue to your geostrophy calculations. So a lot of times these sort of CTD sections are uniformly spaced sections and if you're not careful you might have some issues there. Um, something that I don't go into a lot here but one of the findings from this array is that there's more, tra more ISO transport than previously measured upstream. But if you take the geostrophic estimate, it compares pretty well to some of the previous estimates. So are using geostrophic estimates sort of systematically underestimating the ISO transport, so that net export out of the basin, sort of a question that warrants further question investigating. Um, and then yes, this sort of a long ridge flow variability that has this really strong ageostrophic component isn't just important for where we measure, but it leaves an impact on the MOC across that whole eastern OSAP section. Cool. Okay. Now we're going to switch gears one more time. We're going to zoom in a little bit more. We're going to look at turbulent scales. And so this whole turbulence chapter was motivated by the fact that I spent a lot of time looking at these density contours from the OSNAP array, and this doming feature that I zoom in on here is a really prominent feature, not just in our mooring observations, but in all the CTD sections, and in CTD sections from other projects that go nearby the same region. And sort of typically, this consistent feature is interpreted as a sign of strong bottom intensified mixing. Uh, basically, when you have a lot of mixing that's intensified at the bottom, you get this sort of dipole of convergence where you have downward convergence of buoyancy, and then because more is converging down over or underneath a layer where less is moving, you get a divergence and that causes these isopycnals to dome. That's sort of as much as we need to go into that for now. Uh, but basically, it's always interpreted as mixing, but no one had really gone and quantified what's the mixing rates along the iso pathway. Uh, so now I'm doing it. Okay. And so Without giving away the whole plot too much, one of the other sort of open questions in the research around ISO is, so if you look at this plot, this is sort of the transport estimates at various locations along the ISO pathway. And that 5.3 next to the OSNAP mooring line in green is what we measure from the, over, from the OSNAP array. And then if you look downstream, a lot of recent studies have been finding that a significant fraction of it, half, maybe more, is ending up on the eastern side. And this is sort of shift away from, classically, we thought a lot of it would sort of wrap around the ridge to the west and either circulate in the Erminger Sea or go straight west and end up in the deep western boundary current and end up being exported sort of through that pathway. And so this new set of observations that have been emerging over the last like 10 years we don't have a good explanation for it. And so I want just that to be in the back of your head without trying to give away too much too quick. We'll get back to that idea and how it might relate to mixing. Okay. Um, so sort of intuitively when you think of flow and topography, when the topography gets really rough, you'd expect there to be more turbulence which because the flow has to get around the topography, it can generate waves. So you can actually just pull out, I pulled out the topography along this orange contour on this map here. Roland, this might have crashed. 
I don't know if it's still, it crashed on here. Yeah, it's reconnecting. I don't know. Pause. So it crashed for both of us? Uh, it crashed on this screen. I don't know if that matters. <clears throat> Could that be the same Pause. internet issue that you had at the beginning? Well, my laptop is still connected. Yeah, it looks as if I'm connected as well. So, uh, both the, so is your laptop still connected to the Zoom? <laughs> Because you are a co-host, so it could still work when I'm not connected. Now it's reconnecting to, to Zoom. It looks as if I'm having a problem with the Zoom. I'm the Zoom, Zoom server. It says I'm screen sharing. Yeah, so, may, so it may be still okay for you. Check. Can you check who is can who someone, still in the Zoom meeting? Yeah, I can see who's in the Zoom meeting. Uh, can someone in the room just... So maybe it's just the radiant and, and I, uh, and so if you turn your your own microphone on, maybe they can hear you and your speaker. Maybe maybe they are already speaking to us and we cannot hear them because your speaker is muted. Can people in the Zoom hear me? Yes, now, yeah, but there was a minute or two that we couldn't hear you. Okay, I'll just leave it on my Sorry. laptop. Yeah, they continue then. that way, and I'm, I'm, as soon as the Zoom comes back, it will probably work again. But okay, yeah, I'll just, do, I'll just do it that way. Oh, oh, Bill is changing the laptop. I thought, <laughs> yeah. I thought that's going on now. Okay. Just closing the whole thing down. <laughs> okay. see the screen a little bit. There's, There's issues. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Alright. That sounds as if the Yeah, it reconnected is, up here now. So the radiant is connected again. Okay. 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 I'm assuming everyone can hear me now. Okay, now I'm back in the business here. <laughs> so that cool. topography is going along the yellow line. Yeah, okay. Resuming. Uh, so this this topography in this plot is going along that yellow line on the map and from right to left is for the direction that the ISO flows along this topography. And you can see as you get sort of on the ridge and then further down the ridge where there's this fracture zone, you get this really strong shift into really sharp, short period. It's like small wave, like horizontal scale, large vertical scale wavelengths or vertical scale topography. Let's uh, unmute this. Now it should be all back. Yeah, mute, yeah. mute everything there again. Um, okay, so we can, so this uh, study by J uh, Jody Klimak and all gave us a sort of useful framework for thinking about how flow might evolve when you get into the different regimes of topography. So if you put in values, so mean values of the stratification and the strength of the flow, at the upstream part of ISO, you're in this sort of medium scale linear regime, that's sort of the bottom left panel in this schematic here. And as you get into the sharper topography of the fracture zone, you start moving into the nonlinear and small scale regimes where you expect these big boundary layers or so a lot of mixing happening. So this, we want to basically test as that flow hits the rough topography, can we quantify that more mixing is happening? I think that crashed again. Uh, so, I've been sort of vague about what I mean by mixing, but essentially the term we want to get to is this one at the bottom, this vertical eddy diffusivity, the KZ. It's a, essentially a rate of mixing. And the OSNAP project as a whole really wasn't designed to measure mixing, so I had to get a little creative. Is it still working? Yeah, the internet is unstable, uh, it showed here. So is everything disconnected now? No, you are still screen sharing. Okay. So I think if you activate your microphone again, they, they can hear you through that. Should we just turn that off in case? Just turn your microphone on until we have everything back. Okay. Hope you guys can hear me. Um, so I wasn't, you can't really use the moorings that we have to measure mixing, but we can apply this process, this method called the Thorpe scales method without really getting into the weeds of the detail. Essentially you relate these little deviations in the temperature profile to sort of mixing events, so actual overturns in the, in the water column. 
and using that method, you get a dissipation rate. This is the epsilon value. And from that epsilon value, you can get a vertical eddy diffusivity that's related to the dissipation rate by sort of scaling factor and the stratification. So I use this method and I had to basically compile a whole lot of CTD sections in such a way that I could look at the evolution of mixing along the pathway of the overflow. So starting with the Ellet line upstream, I have a bunch of sections that let me move downstream and examine what's happening as the flow actually encounters this rough topography. So we'll step through what those sections actually produce. So for the next set of plots that we're gonna look at, the, con the color shading is the strength of mixing. So the more red to yellow is stronger mixing. And the contours are the potential density the upper thick white one on is okay. The upper thick one is the 27.8, and the one below is just another density contour, so you can sort of see, look at the thickness of it, which ends up being an important concept. So starting with this upstream Ellet line section, before we're actually on the ridge, we don't see that doming of the isopycnals, they largely just follow the topography. Looks like there might be a little bit of mixing towards the bottom, but maybe not a lot compared to what we'll see downstream. And then the next sort of further along the pathway is right at the top of the ridge. Still don't see much doming. There's not really a change in the mixing. You can keep moving south. So this is the OSNAP section. Maybe there's a little bit more mixing, but we still don't see a whole lot of doming occurring in the isopycnal, so not that structure that we observe at the OSNAP line. Um, I think the radiant is offline again. Can, can you activate your microphone again? Oh no, the radiant is, is online, it's muted now. Unmute the radiant. All right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so we're still not sort of in the really rough topography and we, we aren't seeing a whole lot of mixing just yet, but we can keep going south. The next is the actual OSNAP lines of the CTD sections we do at the moorings. And now we see the mixing really turn on in the bottom few hundred meters. Um, and we see that characteristic domed structure that got me interested in, is there mixing in the first place? And so that fits really well with the idea of that sort of scale analysis where the rougher the topography, you're gonna to get these mixed layers with a lot of mixing. Um, and then we have this other kind of cool view. This project did a section right along the axis of the ridge. So it doesn't really sample in the overflow layer, but you can see as you move down the ridge, so south is to the left, you get a lot more mixing as you get down the ridge where the topography gets really rough. And so, So one of the things with sort of mixing studies that typically use Thorpe scales, usually you do Thorpe scales and you validate it with like a microstructure profiler, something that is a more direct measurement of dissipation. I don't think this was really ever meant to be a mixing study in my PhD, so we don't have that kind of information. But by luck, there's a mooring just south of the OSNAP array in the same area that was designed for mixing. And I'm not gonna go a whole lot into the details of it, but I was able to calculate sort of the same KZ values with an independent method, uh, independent data set, and get same order of magnitude of KZ. So that's sort of, a, it gives us some trust that these mixing estimates that we're getting actually are real. We've got two independent ways of actually getting at that number, the KZ. So we can put it all together uh, from top left, read it like a book, you can see as you go down southward along the ISO pathway, you really get this strong mixing when you hit the topography. And so this is sort of the first part. It was really cool that we could actually quantify the fact that there is more mixing. What are those rates? But I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the fact that, okay, this is a permanent feature essentially of the overflow layer at the OSNAP array. And if it's causing this change in the layer, something has to change with it to maintain balance. So to really dive into that, I started thinking about things in terms of potential vorticity. So do a little quick recap of why it's useful. So potential vorticity is essentially 
can combine the stratification and flow into this single variable that is conserved. So that, it lives, it's a useful tool to sort of diagnose what's happening with these different changes in the flow. So I just started thinking about the fact like back to GFD1 when you have this sort of layer wise PV where you have a fluid column and it rotates, if something stretches it, in our case mixing, there has to be a response where it spins up. So essentially if H gets bigger, that top term, the absolute vorticity spinniness has to rise too to balance that Q term out because it's conserved. Uh, so that's sort of what got me thinking in the PV direction. Turns out this layer simple framework doesn't quite work for what we're doing, so I had to go back and start from scratch. So I started with the full Ertel PV, so that's this product of the absolute vorticity, it's this omega term, which is F and the relative vorticity, and the divergence of the buoyancy field. So that's a pretty, you can expand that out, and I was, I'm gonna basically use this to assess quantitatively the PV and try to get to a PV budget for the overflow layer that incorporates the mixing. So to do that, we gotta start making some simplifications. So first thing I did is think about things in terms of this rotated coordinate system. So Y is along the ridge, positive southward, just like in those velocity pictures we were looking at. And then X is perpendicular to the ridge, and we're gonna assume that the gradients are really dominated by the vertical and the cross ridge, so those X direction gradients. And we can test this with data, and we know even if we are really looking at an evolution of the plume, those gradients are still less than the ones that are in the cross direction by an order of magnitude. Uh, and then when we start getting into the budget, we'll assume steady state. So if you apply all these assumptions and do a little bit of crossing out of things, I get to this form of PV, which is essentially a vertical term, that first term, which is the product of the stratification and the absolute vorticity. And then you get this horizontal term, which is the cross slope buoyancy gradient and the vertical shear. So we can plug in observations and directly estimate PV using this. So we get this really cool uh, picture of the PV where there's a low PV layer through the bottom of the, the ISO layer. And if you compare this to where the mixing happens, it lines up really well. So that low PV layer is pretty intimately linked to the strength of mixing which makes a lot of sense because you think about mixing, mixing essentially erodes stratification. And if you look at your PV balance, that stratification is a leading order term. You lower it, you're gonna lower PV by quite a bit. Uh, yeah, and so, it's not working out. All right, so that term, that first term that I highlighted is sort of sets the dominant balance and it's largely set by the stratification. I do wanna just point out that the second term ends up being really important in the context of a lot of work going on looking at sub-mesoscale instabilities on sloping boundary flows because if mixing is happening and you get this low PV state, that second term is what can end up triggering instability. So it, it's sort of an important thing to keep in mind. I just wanted to mention it because it's, it's not unimportant, but I, I don't really deal with it going forward. Okay, so I was able to calculate PV. I, get this clear result that mixing seems to be reducing the PV in the bottom of the ISO layer and in the bottom layers above, just sort of above the ISO layer too, or towards the top of the ridge. But if something is eroding PV, PV is supposed to be sort of a conserved quantity. So I wanted to understand what's balancing it and is, is that tell me something about how the flow responds to this change in PV. So now we got to, is this gonna work? Sweet, okay. So, we're gonna build a PV budget. So we start with our PV in the top right, and this is a classical starting point for your thinking about your PV budget. Your DQ, DT is the divergence of this J vector. And this J vector has three terms, an advective term, so PV being advected by the flow field around it. You have a diabatic fluxes term, so this is gonna be our mixing term. It'll simplify down to just the vertical mixing term. And then you have a frictional term. And we wanna simplify this because it gets unwieldy quick. So we're gonna basically use the similar assumptions when we were formulating the PV. The gradients in the Y direction are negligible. These diabatic fluxes are dominating the, are dominated by mixin. So that vertical component. 
and away from sort of the bottom frictional boundary layer, we're going to assume friction is negligible. So we can do that, do some math, simplify that uh, J vector down a little bit. And then if you take the divergence of that J vector, just you plug it in to that equation on the right, you get this budget on the bottom. So your DQDT equals this horizontal advective term plus this vertical mixing term. And then we also want to assume steady state. And then if you look at the product of that F plus DV DX, DV DX is a couple order magnitude less than Coriolis. So we can knock that out. And then I basically took that triple derivative in the vertical direction and called it DZ. So we get rid of two of the derivatives in the notation, just makes it a little easier to look at. Uh, and you get this maybe too neat, but a nice neat balance at the bottom here in green. And what essentially this is saying is the vertical potential vorticity flux due to mixing, so that D, D, Z, D, Z term, is being balanced by some sort of cross-flow advection of PV. And we can plug in data and test if this actually holds. So the mixing, we know that the mixing in those dome dice signals are really strong around D1 and M1, so I took the data averaged around that area and plugged it into this formula in such a way that you can get a U profile because we observe U at the, at the moorings, so I can directly compare. So plugging in data, we get this plot. So let's break this down. The, the blue curve is the cross slope component measured from moorings. So positive is southward or, de or eastward down slope. The red curve is the log scale eddy diffusivity, so that mixing. So it's a mixing, essentially the strength of mixing. And you plug those values in along with the stratification that we get from observations, and you get this yellow curve, which is the U profile, so this cross slope profile based on this balance. And it sort of holds really well on the order of magnitude and the sign, uh, which is, first of all, a really cool result because that means this balance to leading order seems to hold that this mixing is driving some sort of cross slope flow. It looks like it underestimates it here, but when you think about sort of the uncertainties associated with estimating KZ from Thorpe scales, I probably would say you can't really say if it's under or overestimating. You can argue that the magnitudes and sign balance correctly, but beyond that, it's sort of hard to say. Um, and then that U profile is really sensitive to the shape of that KZ profile and N squared, which makes sense because you're taking triple derivatives in the vertical direction. So when you are dealing with observational data, this can lead to unwieldy things, but if you, the results still hold across most of the ridge where the mixing is really strong. It's a really cool result. You get this leading order balance between downslope mixing and, or downslope flow and mixing. So that in and of itself is a really cool result because we tend to think of this geostrophic flow or mostly geostrophic flow as the last part showed. And now there's this component that is really intimately linked to the mixing. And just thinking back to these variance ellipses from the last section, M1 and D1, those two to the furthest to the west, consistently show this downslope component. So this is a, basically the argument we're making here, I'm making here is that downslope component is due in t to balance the mixing essentially. Now why, why does this really matter? Let's sort of zoom out and think about the overflow layer. Uh, as a whole current. So we start with it overflowing at the ferrobank channel and it circulates around the Iceland basin and you get this in accumulation of mixing which causes this low PV layer as that flow hits the topography. So that balance that we've shown here is arguing that essentially the more mixing you have you're going to generate this cross slope flow. And so the more and more mixing as that topography sort of gets increasingly rough to the point where it's just a lot of mixing happening, you get this sort of barrier of low PV. So that ISO flow actually really wants to go down slope more than it wants to cross around and go through gaps in the ridge. And so I call this a PV shield, a mixing generated PV shield. And so I mentioned this at the beginning of this section that there's this new set of observations, 
continually coming out that show a whole lot of ISO is staying on the eastern side. And so these results are really the first dynamic framing for why we might be seeing a lot of ISO stay on the eastern side. This isn't to say ISO can't get out, but you need sort of a big push to get it out. It preferentially wants to stay, go eastward, um, which is pretty cool. No one's got a dynamics reason for why we might be seeing a lot of ISO. And this really highlights the fact that like, I mean, if you're considering this large scale AMOC related current, the small scale topography and these mixing processes seem like they might be leaving a pretty big impact on the large scale circulation. Huh. So yeah, that was a pretty cool result that came out of mixing. That was somewhat unexpected, but yeah. Um, okay, so a little conclusion. Just wrap up what I did. I first looked at large scale hydrographic processes, looking at this freshening event and how entrainment caused this sort of really quick shift in the salinity in the salinity of the ISO layer and how that can act as a conduit for transmitting density anomalies essentially through the AMOC system. And then we zoomed in and we looked at the mesoscale transport variability, really show that the topography and sort of the ageostrophic effects of the topography are leaving a pretty big impact on the net overturning variability. And then lastly, we looked at these really small scale processes got to do this cool quantification of the mixing rates and show that you sort of leave this large impact on where ISO wants to go because of these small scale processes. And this is sort of a cool thing that came out of the thesis in each of the chapters. Looked at one set of scales in time and space, but there were these impacts across larger and smaller scales in each of the processes that came out of them. So that was a pretty cool way it came out. Questions? Thank you, Manish. Uh, let's open for questions. Do you guys have any questions here? Um, can you go, well, first of all, good talk. Um, can you go back to the mesoscale transport variability with your transport over time? It's a very specific question, so if you didn't look at it, that's fine. Look at <laughs> Just like the transport time series? Yeah. Yeah, so I noticed in like early 2018, you have like this really sharp increase in transport. Did you look at that at all and see like what was causing it or look at the cross section? So the it looks like there was like a huge storm essentially, like a big storm and eddy. So I looked at sort of wind stress okay. over that time. There's this big storm eddy looking thing that sits over there. Okay. And so when I broke up the transport and you saw that like the the stuff in the middle of the basin, even though there's not a lot of net transport, that was a lot of the variability. Okay. That whole signal is really from stuff going on on the basin interior that was like really spinning up inside the basin interior. Okay, so not like down in the rut where you were looking. No, this was that whole, you're talking early 2018, yeah. right? There's that big dip and spike. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty much entirely driven by what's going on in the interior of the basin. Okay, what but, it was like wind driven then? Yes, wind eddy driven, some, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. That's all I thought. Um, do you think that any of the water that uh, like overflowed over the ridge further up north, that it would have a similar effect of the vorticity shield in sending it west as it flows south? So like, so like stuff that crossed before the O-snap array? Yeah, so like cross and it's now west of M1 on the other side of the ridge. And like, so do you think that kind of ridge is just kind of creating like really separate branches? I think it probably doesn't work quite the same, uh, partially because there's not as clear of a current that goes northward on that side of the ridge in the ISO layer. Uh, so you need that sort of velocity, strong velocity, one, to generate mixing, and two, that uh, part of the relative vorticity term ends up being key when you calculate it. Also, it seems like a lot of that ISO tends to just get ejected straight westward if it does cross through. So no, I don't I don't think it works the same on the other side. Yeah. Thanks, Manish. That's really good. Um, the your sort of PV shield and the and the and the sort of deflection, how localized is that? Is that just gonna happen when just when you've got the rough topography? 
as soon as it moves off the ridge, you're gonna get a well, yeah, so change in PV, and it's gonna. So. So yeah, I think it is somewhat localized to the rough topography, but there's a good few hundred kilometers stretch where there is rough topography. And then once you pass where that rough topography is, you get into the fracture zone. So the idea is partially it sort of doesn't want to go east, but also that rough topography, there's quite a span where there is rough topography before it gets there. So you're getting you've already had a bunch of ISO sort of move down the slope, so it's less sort of available, if that's the right way to say it, to cross. Um, but yeah, when those gaps drop out, there's probably a big change because your layer thickness is gonna change pretty significantly. Uh, there's some cool studies by Sagia that basically, those big transport events through the gaps were driven by upper ocean stuff, so like really strong anti-cyclones that essentially kick the PV the other way and lets it go, is how I understand it. A question from afar, uh, when you go to a gap, um, I don't, uh, the gap has to readjust. I don't think it can take all the transport. You always have to have some that goes past, hydraulically. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I don't think it is like fully blocking the PV. I think it's sort of an explanation for why more of it than we had classically thought is not crossing. So it, it's facilitating some amount of it to not cross. Whereas we used to, we sort of expected previously that a lot of it is crossing. And then the observation showed that a lot of it isn't crossing. So this is a reason why more of it might not be crossing. But yeah, some of it still has to get through. And we observed some going through. I, I, the point is, is hydraulically, if you just have an ideal fluid uh, a rotating plane going past the gap, some of it has to go past. The Kelvin wave can only adjust so much. I'm not sure if they question. <laughs> it's another theory for why. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, Roland, do we have any other question? No, I don't see any more. John's gone. If you lose uh, <clears throat> uh, the geostrophic relationship because the friction has overwhelmed the process, then uh, essentially it's free to flow down slope. Uh, just uh, on d density basis, right? Yeah, and that sort of might fit close to the bottom, but we see this spread above the topography a few hundred meters. Is, is there any um, tracer data that, that would be useful in looking at the mixing process? Not that I know of. Um, so, OSNAP is not really designed to look at mixing. Right. Uh, so not only are the moorings not designed for mixing, the, the CTD sections that we did, we're not sort of having experiments that got at mixing. We just did sort of standard CTD, LADCP sections. Um, there is those, so the one, I, sh I showed one profile from the moorings that are nearby. They have sort of time evolution of the mixing. And there might be some more details hidden in there. Uh, but the time variability, I spent a lot of time looking at it and it's so chaotic that it was hard to pull anything out. Thank you. Okay then, uh, that's a really interesting discussion. So thank you so much Manish. And thank you everybody for coming. Did I pass? Can I just... <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>